Hello, hello, and welcome to another episode of the Unstoppable Woman podcast. I'm Amir Alvarez, the founder and CEO of the Unstoppable Woman, and I'm so happy you have joined us for this episode today. Today, we're re-releasing one of our most popular episodes from our Morning Mindset Club series, which dives deep into one of my absolute favorite texts, Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. This episode is an oldie but a goodie that we wanted to highlight again because there's such a critical connection between self-confidence and the success of your business. And quite frankly, it's something that I get asked about a lot. In addition, it's important to know the difference between healthy self-esteem and a big ego when you think about building your self-confidence. It's a thin line with big consequences. So let's dive in. Enjoy. There is a more life directive for growth in this world that we all have. And that more life directive is not just for your more life, but it's for everyone's more life. The Thinking Yourself into Exponential Results series on the podcast comes to you every Saturday morning and takes what we discuss in the Morning Mindset Club, compiles it into one easy to access recording and gives you some killer bonus content at the end that's not to be missed and only available here. So let's dive right in. Good morning, I'm Amira Alvarez and welcome to another great day with the Morning Mindset Club. We are on number 27 of the 30 major causes of failure. Number 27 is intentional dishonesty. This is somewhat of an obvious one, but let's go go deeper into it. Hill says, there is no substitute for honesty. One may be temporarily dishonest by force of circumstances over which one has no control without permanent damage. But there is no hope for the person who is dishonest by choice. Sooner or later, his deeds will catch up with him and he will pay by loss of reputation and perhaps even loss of liberty. So let's go back to this line about temporary dishonesty by force of circumstances. Now, what might that be? That is, those are legitimate mistakes that they are unintentional dishonesty. You, you make a math, uh, mistake summing something up and that's not an intentional, uh, ripping someone off. You, you just added it up wrong. Uh, you transpose a number, you, um, put the wrong thing unintentionally in a contract. Uh, you, you, there's an oversight and you didn't mean to do something and that it looks wrong. Okay. All of that is not from an energy behind it of intentionality to rip someone off, to lie to someone, to, to be dishonest. You are for all intents and purposes showing up as an honest person, but you've made a mistake and it's temporary and it's unintentional. Now, there is then intentional dishonesty. And most people would say that they are not dishonest, that they are not a dishonest person. But if you ask a room of people if they've ever told a lie, anyone who doesn't raise their hand is the liar in the room because every single person has told a lie at some point. So we know that people are dishonest. So there are small lies and big lies. And where do you draw the line? Long ago, many years ago, I decided I was not going to tell white lies, that it was a slippery slope. And this is true of exaggeration as well. I come from a family, I love them to pieces, that tells stories and every year that the story gets bigger and bigger, more and more exaggerated. It's the classic fish tale, right? Where the fish is now 16 feet long, right? And, and, and it's a similar idea that it, it takes you away 
from the truth and you want to stay in truth. So I would suggest to you that you clean this up, these small little white lies that you might be telling about why you were late or, you know, was it really the traffic? Um, lies that you tell yourself, excuses and stories, rationalizations that you make. Stop those little white lies to others and to yourself and start cleaning that up. And just in the moment where you feel like it's easier to tell a small little lie than to explain the situation or, or figure out how to communicate honestly, stop and pause and figure it out. It will do you such a big service. And then of course, they are, there are the bigger lies in life, the, the, the very conscious ripping off um, dishonesty that happens. And Hill says here, sooner or later, his deeds will catch up with him and he will pay by the loss of reputation and perhaps even loss of liberty. But you know what? The bigger payment is how you live on the daily, on the inside, wondering if someone's going to find you out because you've lied, not liking yourself, not being in integrity with yourself is such an energy suck. And, and this is not how to live. This is not how to show up. It will drain you. And yes, it will come back to haunt you. So don't do that. Clean that up. Good morning and welcome to another great day with the Morning Mindset Club. I'm Amira Alvarez and let's get started. So we are on number 28 of the 30 major causes of failure. Number 28 is egotism and vanity. Hill says these qualities serve as red lights, which warn others to keep away. They are fatal to success. So egotism is the act, the practice of talking and thinking about oneself excessively because of an undue sense of self-importance. And it comes from fear. It comes from feeling not enough. It comes from needing to prove and justify yourself. And quite frankly, it is self-involved. It's all about yourself. It's a very selfish place to walk through this world from. And if you've been following this teaching at all, you know that there is a more life directive for growth in this world that we all have. And that more life directive is not just for your more life, but it's for everyone's more life. And you need to be looking about how you show up in this world of service to others. When you provide more service to others, your life grows. That's the beauty of this more life directive. Each of us can contribute. And the more we contribute, the more we receive. And the same thing with vanity. Vanity is the excessive pride in yourself, in your own appearance or your own achievement. Now, it's healthy to have pride in what you've done. It's healthy to have a a strong sense of self, self self-worth, self-esteem. These are are important to your confidence and your ability to, to be in this world and show up. But it's the excessiveness that causes the problem. So when you have excessive pride, this this goes into the area of hierarchy and better than thou. You're thinking that you are better than your fellow person, your fellow man, your fellow woman, your fellow brother, your fellow sister, that you are better than thou. And that is not okay. And people can feel this. They can feel the egotism. They can feel the vanity and they want nothing to do with it. Plus it's going to create huge blind spots for yourself. You will not recognize what you need to recognize in yourself that needs to change in order for you to avoid failure and end up a success. So you need to look at these two aspects of your personality, egotism and vanity. Is it healthy or dysfunctional? What's your gut reaction to that and how you're showing up on the daily? Good morning. I'm Amira Alvarez and welcome to another great day with the Morning Mindset Club. We are on number 29 of the 30 major causes of failure. So we're getting to the end of this list. 
this chapter on organized planning has a lot of lists in it, which is great because we can really dive deep into these individual ideas. So number 29 is guessing instead of thinking. Hill says most people are too indifferent or lazy to acquire facts with which to think accurately. They prefer to act on opinions created by guesswork or snap judgments. So really the issue here is that you're being run by the world outside of you. You are a victim to circumstance, to things outside of you, and you're using your subconscious programming, your belief structure to analyze what's going on or not really analyze, but make a snap judgment about what the causes are of the results that you are getting. And that is, as Hill says, lazy thinking. And it and it's going on autopilot, what you've already done. It's pack mentality. It's group think. It's not thinking for yourself. And if you want to be successful, you really need to understand the causes that create effects. And to start getting good at this, you have to start asking better questions. So first and foremost, if you get a result that you like or that you dislike, you need to ask, is the thing that I think is causing that the true cause of this? Could there be something else that's causing this? What are the other things that could cause this? You must inquire. You must dig in. Have you inquired? You must ask yourself this. Most people don't. Do you have data? I'm constantly asking my clients, do you have a, to keep metrics to look at the data? Now, you, you know, it can become overwhelming to keep data on everything, but the bigger your business is, the more people you'll have working for you and the better your ability to track things will be. And the more data you have, the better decisions you can make because you're not making an emotional decision that's based on guess, guesswork, thinking that something is happening when really something else is happening because we have skewed perspectives. We see things from our own perspective. So I'm often, you know, saying to my clients, make love to the numbers. And this happens a lot when I ask them, so where are your clients coming from? Or if you sell a product, where, where are those sales coming from? And you dig into the numbers and they're coming from a different place than you originally thought. Or you think the majority of your income is coming from this product line when it's really coming from a different one and you need to put your efforts over here instead of over there. So you must not go by guesswork. You must really dig into the numbers. And then there are assumptions that happen uh, in this kind of quote unquote lazy thinking. And you must ask the question, have you given your initiative enough time? Have you given the effect that you want enough time to come to fruition. Do you need to, to get more data here before you make an adjustment or a shift or a new decision? So are you making emotional decisions about the success and structure, the, the direction and structure of your, your business? And when I say emotional decisions, I'm not meaning driven by desire. I am speaking about being driven by fear and frustration. When you're irritated, when you're upset, when you're wondering why it's not working fast enough, if you're frustrated by the amount of time something is taking and, and you make a snap judgment that you should throw the baby out with the bathwater, that is guessing or lazy thinking as uh, Hill would say. So inquire, hold yourself to a higher standard here. Okay. Good morning and welcome to another episode of the Morning Mindset Club. I'm Amira Alvarez and let's get started. We are now on number 30 of the 30 major causes of failure. We are wrapping up this list though. Hill does give a number 31 where he says under this Name any particular cause of failure from which you have suffered that has not been included in the foregoing list. That's his catch-all phrase. So we're not going to spend much time on number 31. Number 30 is lack of capital. 
Hill says, this is a common cause of failure among those who start out in business for the first time without sufficient reserves of capital to absorb the shock of their mistakes and to carry them over until they have established a reputation. So this is so very, very true. You do need a certain amount of financial capital, some savings on which to rest on so that you can make it through those first initial phases of your business. It will take some extraordinary effort to get that ball moving, you to get the momentum going. The, the early stages of business are much harder than the later stages of business because you are getting everything rolling and generally speaking, you are bootstrapping things. Now, financial capital is very important for another reason. If you don't have enough in reserves, then you're going to get into desperation and scarcity thinking. You're going to start worrying about not having enough and your energy is going to be spent on the worry and not on the execution of the things that need to be executed on in your business. This happens all the time and it's extraordinarily painful when you're going through it. Worry is negative faith. Worry is not believing. Worry is a freaking waste of energy. Recognize the problem that's in front of you and solve the problem. Worrying doesn't solve the problem. Now, I've seen this on the other side of things where people have quit their day job after saving a lot of money so that they have, you know, three months, six months, a year of reserves, but then they fritter away those reserves because they are afraid of doing the hard things, the challenges, the big things in their business. They're afraid of rejection, making mistakes, um, all sorts of things. They avoid making sales. They, they run screaming from the room from sales. And yet that is what you need to learn how to do if you are going to run a business because sales is what moves money in business. You have to be making sales or you won't be in business any longer. So people spend a lot of time on other things to avoid sales because sales is challenging. It's it's emotionally challenging until you master it and understand how to really show up in service in sales. Um, and you have to want it badly enough. So um, having the reserve of capital is not a cause of success, but not having the reserve of capital can be one of the potential causes of failure. Not automatically. You can make up for this lack of financial capital by having other kinds of capital like intellectual capital, speed, strength of your mindset so you don't go into worry, doubt, or fear, uh, grit, determination, hustle. So all of those things come into play in the, the factors of success and getting a business off the ground, plus many other things. So this is something to consider. Ask yourself if you have what it takes to really get your business started if you're in that phase. If you don't have the financial capital, then do you have the imagination? Do you have the initiative? Do you have the the grit, the speed of making decisions, the determination, the hustle? Will you go out there and make sales? Good morning and welcome to another great day with the Morning Mindset Club. I'm Amira Alvarez and let's get started. So Hill finishes up this section on the 30 major causes of failure by saying this. It is one thing to want money. Everyone wants more. But it is something entirely different to be worth more. Many people mistake their wants for their just dues. Your financial requirements or wants have nothing whatever to do with your worth. Your value is established entirely by your ability to render useful service or your capacity to induce others to render such service. This is huge, guys. This is such an important piece. It's not just wishing or wanting more that creates more. You must give more. You must render better service, more value, higher value. You must help other people. 
This is helping others create more life. You must solve problems for others and help them have a bigger, better life. This is what you must do. Now, how do you do that? In the beginning, there's a variety of different places where we could take this conversation. But for today, I want to point this out. In the beginning, when you're first starting your business, you must over deliver. Now, I would say you need to over deliver at all stages of business. You must continue to become too big for the container that is you so that you grow the amount that you receive. That said, in the beginning, this is absolutely essential and it feels bigger than it is later because you will be used to doing it later. It will become natural for you later. But in the beginning, you must over deliver. Now, what does this mean? You must get more experience now. You must stretch yourself now to have bigger experiences in order to become more. And it causes you to be worth more. In the beginning, you have, say, a set level of experience. We'll call that level A experience. And that's worth one thing, but it's not worth the amount of money that you wish to receive. Well, you must gain the experience and expertise to be worth more. This means you must over deliver at level A. You must deliver level B, if you will, but get paid for level A. And then you will be worth more and you will know that. Then you can receive more and you keep doing this. Now, there's a difference between features and benefits in what you're delivering. So when I say over deliver, sometimes we actually mean doing more things. Those would be features, more hours, more deliverables, more specific things that take your time and energy to do. But then you must also over deliver benefits. Benefits are the results that the person gets. Now, in the beginning, you won't have the expertise to deliver high-level results or high-level benefits without a huge amount of features that you're giving. You will not have the expertise to do it without a lot of bells and whistles, time and effort. You will have to put your hours in, so to speak. That's a feature. That's like a 60-minute coaching call. That's like a webinar. That's like a training. That's like a, um, a, a, if you're a copywriter, it's how many things you write for people, right? You will be paid by the word instead of by the result, So those are the features. And in the beginning, when you're getting your business off the ground, you will have to put in more time and effort and provide more features to get paid. But as you grow your expertise, your value increases and you can provide the same level of benefits or more by doing less. And this is what you need to do. So you must render useful service and you must continue to render it at higher and higher levels. This is how you increase your worth. Good morning and welcome to another great day with the Morning Mindset Club. I'm Amira Alvarez and let's get started. So this next section in the chapter on organized planning is take inventory of yourself, 28 questions you should answer. So in this section, Hill has 28 questions that relate to the major causes of failure. And he suggests that you analyze yourself at the end of every year. And to to ask yourself these questions with a level of truth and honesty. Self-analysis doesn't work if you see everything through rose colored glasses, if you see yourself as already there perfect. The flip side is you don't want to be so harsh on yourself that you destroy your self-esteem, you destroy your self-confidence. You want to have 
a accurate analysis of yourself. So rose colored glasses don't work. Seeing yourself as perfect, perfect already doesn't work guys. You, there will always be a place for you to better your best and you have to know that. So you might as well get honest with that and, and really step into it. Now, the flip side again is saying that you're terrible and not good enough and, and falling down and a failure and, um, you know, the lowest little, uh, worm in the world. Right. And that's not true. I love me an earthworm, but still that's not true. You want to look at yourself with a level of truth and accuracy. How much truth can you accept about yourself? This is so critical. So you're going to want to put this on the calendar, on your calendar for the end of the year. I like to do it between Christmas and New Year's. That's a beautiful, quiet time of the year to really do some, some deep thinking and, and planning and self-assessment. And it would be useful if you started this now. So wherever you are at in the calendar, it would be well worth your time and energy to take a look at these 12, uh, excuse me, these 28 questions and answer them for yourself right now. And in fact, one really powerful thing you could do is to, to put it on your calendar for the next two to three months so that you get in the habit of looking at where you stand with these things because out of sight, out of mind, and you want to build the habit of paying attention to these 28 points so that you can continue to better your best. You could even do it at the end of every week if you wanted to for a month and see if you could get into the habit of really assessing where you're at and bettering your best. So as you go through these questions, you want to ask yourself, you know, what's the answer to them? And then what would I do differently? What could I do differently? How would I clean this up? How would I show up better? How would I better my best? Good morning and welcome to another great day with the Morning Mindset Club. I'm Amira Alvarez and let's get started. We are going to close out this chapter on organized planning in this episode. Even though Hill has written quite a bit in the next probably 10 to 15 pages here. You're going to want to look and look at this and read it yourself. He goes on a bit of a personal rant in support of capitalism. And it's important to read what he has to say. I don't want to break it down into a huge amount of detail, but the big point here that he's making is that, and how it relates to this concept of organized planning is that in the United States of America, we have tremendous freedoms and tremendous, tremendous standard of living. And he uses the example of a breakfast for two back in the day when he wrote this book, costing 20 cents, that's 10 cents a person. And he breaks down where all of these elements come from, the egg, the, the tea, the toast, all of that. And he says, you know, the tea comes from China. The bananas come from South America. The bread comes from Kansas. The eggs come from Utah. And he goes through all of this and he breaks down the, the cost of each item and where it comes from. And he makes this argument that it is the capitalists of America, the industrialists of America, and quite frankly, worldwide in, in China as well, that have organized industry so that they can bring you these goods and services at a reasonable rate and that you don't have to figure out how to get that tea from China or that bread from Kansas, okay? That that you can just go to the grocery store and it's there for you. And he makes this argument that the capitalists, the industrialists, uh, we would just call them businessmen and women uh, now, are organizing the goods and services, the ability to get you a solution to your problem and that they are getting paid for that level of organization. Okay. So it's an important piece to understand. And I would encourage you to read through the rest of the chapter. It was written in the 30s, 40s, that, that era, the 1930s and 40s. And it's amazing how the same 
political economic conversations are at play today. And I think it's a very useful conversation and analysis to have with yourself and to see where you stand with this argument. For the bonus content of this episode, I want to go back to number 28 in the 30 major causes of failure and the idea of egotism or vanity. You could also call that arrogance. And what is the difference between egotism, vanity, arrogance, and simply having self-confidence? Because self-confidence is huge. It's a huge asset. It is required to really grow and scale your business. You must, you must have confidence in yourself and be able to project that into the world, impress that upon others for them to trust you and the products and the services that you provide. The more confidence you have in yourself, the more other people will recognize that and will want to work with you or buy from you. So this is absolutely critical. And yet there is false confidence, I would say, which is arrogance. It's not true self-confidence. It's a posturing. It's, it's actually uh, coming from a place of fear and scarcity, like something is going to be taken away from me. So I have to act in this particular way and put this, this defense up that is not expressing the truth of who I am. And you are actually, when you're in arrogance rather than in self-confidence, you, you don't like who you are. You think there is something wrong with who you are. You think you are not enough and you have to posture and put up a front because when you look at yourself, you're not incredibly proud of who you are. So you're going to want to clean up that inside picture so that you can love yourself, like yourself, be proud of yourself and project that with confidence out into the world. Okay, with that, rock it out, be unstoppable, and I'll see you in the next episode. Hey, thanks so much for joining us and being part of the Unstoppable Woman movement. We have got a ton of free resources for scaling your business at theunstoppablewoman.com slash free stuff. And you can find that link in the description below. So go ahead and check those out. And we'd also love your help in getting our message out to more and more women. If you'd be willing to share this video with all the unstoppable women in your life, that would be fantastic. And while you're at it, hit the subscribe button so you never miss an episode. Reviews, likes, and comments are greatly appreciated. We go in and read them all. So thank you for those. And thanks for listening and be unstoppable. <laughs>